Welcome back, one and all, to the latest edition of the Future is So Right podcast. I'm your host, Pete Beal. This is a Green Flame Press production. Thank you so much for listening in. Okay, so if all's gone according to plan, we are back to regularly scheduled programming. Continuing to feel a little bit better every day. If you tuned into the last episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you didn't tune into the last episode, why not? It's linked down in the pinned comment below. Make sure you check it out. We had a lot of fun with that one. And I decided for this episode to sort of uh, continue carrying on a little bit in that vein. So I had a lot of fun reacting to uh, controversial writing opinions that I found on Reddit for the last episode. And so I thought, well, let's go in the opposite direction a little bit. And this week... We're going to be reacting to the best writing advice that writers have ever received. So, that's what I've done my little search for today. I found some topics that are a few years old, some that are a few more recent. So we're going to start with the older ones, move into the more current writing advice, see what's changed, what stayed the same. Should be a lot of fun. Maybe we will glean some useful information. Maybe we'll find some supposedly good advice that's honestly just awful. I guess there's only one way to find out. You gotta keep listening. If you enjoy the content today, please make sure you hit that thumbs up button. It's a huge help to the podcast. And if you hit that subscribe button in the lower right hand corner, wonderful things will happen to you every time I release a new episode. And by that I mean you'll get to listen to a new episode. So, who wouldn't want that? Okay, that's it for my opening spiel today. Let's get right into the fun stuff, shall we? Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. So let's dive right in. And first off, we have the most popular piece of writing advice on this particular thread. And it says, Vomit draft has got to be the most transformative or more politely just being completely uninhibited with a first draft. It's far easier to edit something you've actually written, and it's easy to block yourself overthinking every detail. I agree with this overall, although I've always disliked the term vomit draft. To me, it seems to imply that this draft is sort of doomed to be low quality, and that doesn't necessarily need to be the case from my point of view. But overall, I do agree, and I've spoken on this in past episodes with the first draft, to not be a perfectionist, basically. The vomit draft, so to speak, the idea is just get your story on the page, go back and edit it later. Overall, I'm very much in favor of this. I just don't like the sort of derogatory name that's been given to this practice. I think you could still write a very quality draft while doing so quickly. Obviously, there's always going to be fine-tuning to do. But overall, I would have to say I can understand why this received the most upvotes on this thread. I think it's a great piece of advice for any writer, particularly a beginner. Just get your story on the page, then worry about all those finer details in your second, third, and fourth rounds of edits. Overall, agree. Moving on to another piece of advice, and I really like this one. This is very well put. Every event in a narrative should be connected by therefore or but. If two important scenes can only be connected by and then, you aren't writing a story with forward momentum. I love this. I think this is outstanding. Uh, So essentially what this means is events cause other events to happen. Actions cause reactions it works this way in real life and obviously it should work this way in a well-written story so let's say for example you're writing a a horror novel and uh, the set of characters is in a car in the middle of the woods and they decide not to stop at a gas station fill up because they think they're going to be fine sort of the continuation of this narrative can go in a few directions But it should really flow quite naturally. They run out of gas because they didn't stop for to fill up their tank. And then whatever the horrific events that occur to them in these woods happen. 
That's essentially what this means. Allow your story to follow a natural progression rather than listing off a series of events um, as it was put here with the words and then. So this happened and then this happened and then this happened. If your story flows well, you shouldn't need to have those sort of and then transitions in it. It'll flow really naturally. It'll sort of reach the inevitable conclusion or, as it's put here, there will be a reason within the story as to why things happen in a way other than what we might expect. I gotta say, that is a very well-written piece of writing advice. Every narrative should be connected by therefore or but. I really like that. The next piece of writing advice is short, to the point, and it's a little similar to how the first point that was made, but to put it simply, Finish what you write before you rewrite it. Uh, we touched on it with the first um, piece of writing advice, but again, I'll just reiterate how important this is. If you are constantly going back and rewriting and editing and tweaking your work while you're going through your first draft, it's going to take you a very long time to finish, if you finish at all. There are... I can't even imagine how many millions of unfinished manuscripts out there by authors who got discouraged while constantly trying to rework and tweak their work during their first draft. I don't care who the author is, their first draft is never going to be perfect, neither is yours, and you should stop striving for that. You should be striving to get it all down on the page, and then you can go back later and perfect it. Get that story down, get it out of your brain onto paper or your computer or whatever you're writing on, finish it, and then you can begin torturing yourself by rewriting it. So, 100% agree with that. So far we haven't had anything too controversial in this episode, perhaps like the last one. Maybe I'll have to go down and find some of these downvoted replies make this a little interesting but for now let's continue this person writes it was stephen king who finally made clear to me what a lot of people were saying show don't tell meaning if someone is angry don't write they are angry write something that says they are angry while never actually saying it like john slam the cup down and look up yes this is this is great advice and to be honest i've been planning a show on an episode on show don't tell for quite a while but it's a lot of work to put something like that together it's very it's a topic that takes a lot of work so look for it in the future hopefully in the near future although no promises on that one but overall yes show don't tell is great advice it's something for every writer to keep in mind particularly a beginner over time it's going to sort of become second nature once you've done it enough, once you've implemented the practice into your writing, you're going to do it without really thinking about it. But um, telling instead of showing is definitely a trap that a lot of newer writers fall into because they just don't have the experience and they don't realize when you're in your own head, you don't really think of it as telling or showing. It's all telling a story to you. You're not thinking about it from a reader's point of view. You're thinking about it from a writer's point of view. So that would sort of be my main advice in terms of show, don't tell. Look at this from the perspective of a reader rather than a writer. And you know what? If you have to go through your first draft, like we were talking about earlier, doing more telling than showing, that's not the end of the world. Just make sure when you come through on your future drafts that you're fine-tuning and getting that story just right, implementing more of the show rather than the tell. Once again, be on the lookout for that episode in the future. Have you clicked that red button in the bottom right corner yet? Okay, just making sure. Continuing down our thread of good writing advice, you notice these take less time to get through than those controversial opinions we had a couple weeks ago, but I'm still enjoying it, and I hope that you find some of these pieces of advice to be helpful to you. So, here's the next one. This person says they are shamelessly going to steal their answer from John Green. 
Stop trying to show me how good of a writer you are and tell me a story. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. This person goes on to say, I'm a staff editor for a graduate student lit magazine, and this is what I wanted to write for half of our rejection letters. I am going to shamelessly agree with this 100%. There are a lot of stories out there, and I've talked about this a little bit in my blog. I did essentially a whole blog post about some of the problems I have with the modern fantasy genre. And I feel that there are a lot of authors and writers out there who really want to show how amazing they are as a writer. And listen, rightfully so, they have incredible talent. But in many cases, the story suffers as a result of that. You know, I don't need, for example, and I'm not going to call anyone out here or name names, but I don't need to see, for example, seven pages describing... I don't know, a meadow in a forest, or something like this. It's good to know where the story's taking place, but let's get to the story. What's happening? What are these characters that I care about doing? What's going to be happening moving forward? Let's keep the story moving, rather than stopping off to show us how well you can set a scene, how flowery your prose can get, I, I love good writing, but I hate it when it feels like a writer is trying to show off. Oh, look how amazing my prose is. Please, just... I came here to be entertained, and beautiful writing can certainly be entertaining, but within that beautiful writing needs to be a coherent and hopefully moving storyline. Okay, so I think we're going to move to a different thread because I got to be honest, that one wasn't scratching me where I itch. There's been some good advice, no doubt about it, but I found a little bit more recent. This is from 2019, and this is a little bit of a different context. The thread starter asked for your favorite, quote, expert level writing tips. So these are supposedly writing tips from or for experts. And we're going to start with the original post. Uh, they listed a few, so let's start going through them. When ending a chapter with a cliffhanger, show the surprising thing. Don't end with the door opening and the characters gasping. Show what they're gasping at, and rather than letting the reader guess what it is, which annoys and potentially disappoints them, let the surprise be the implications of what you've revealed. Uh, th this I like quite a bit. Per uh, properly executing a cliffhanger, whether that be, say, the end of a chapter or the end of a book, it can be a really rewarding thing, but not everyone manages to pull it off correctly. Uh, this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. For example, you know, a knock comes at the door and that's where the cliffhanger sort of happens. Well, isn't it better to have, say, a knock come at the door, and you open the door, and there's a shadowy figure standing outside, or there's somebody that we know that could potentially have a conflict with the characters inside the house. Things like that. Rather than only leaving us with, oh, what's happening? Who's on the other side of the door? Show us who's on the other side of the door, and get us thinking about what the implications of that person's presence is. It'll get people thinking about your story in a more in-depth way. I really like that. Uh, next piece of advice. To look like you're awesome at setting up dominoes and knocking them down, plan a bunch of potentially useful plot threads in the early chapters, but set them all up to look innocuous. That way, when one of them comes back later, your readers will think you're a master of plotting and they won't notice all the things you didn't use. Uh, this this can be good advice. Um, I think you really want to be... It's like he said, you really want to be careful to make sure these items look innocuous, just in case, you know, you don't find a use for it later on. But yeah, if executed well, I, I can get behind this idea. Next piece of advice. To differentiate between several characters who are often in scenes together, give each of them one or two rules for their dialogue. 
It doesn't have to be obvious, just little things. This character never uses figures of speech, this character swears a lot, this character is a fan of flowery words, this one speaks in clipped or efficient sentences. Not only will this make it easy to tell who is speaking without tags, it will also feed into their characterizations and go a surprisingly long way toward developing your cast. I really like this too. So far I'm liking what this person has to say overall. But yeah, give each character a few unique traits to their dialogue. I love it. Um, it's something I try to work into my own writing as well with my books. It's something that I really enjoy when you're able to distinctly tell who's speaking just based on the dialogue or the way it's presented rather than having to use a dialogue tag. Um, it, it's going to take some practice for beginners, no doubt about that, and I recommend you know, still occasionally using the dialogue tags, at least until you're confident in your ability. But, I like it. Great way to make your characters unique, make them stand out. Don't be afraid to skip things on the smaller scale. Most of us know that if nothing interesting happens between when the characters leave Pallet Town and when they arrive at Metropolis, we shouldn't write a chapter about it. But it's just as important that if nothing exciting happens between when your hero wakes up and when he sits down to breakfast, don't write about him getting dressed. 100% uh, agree with this. I, I don't know if I could agree with this anymore, and it's something I've spoken about quite a few times on this podcast. The frustration I get sometimes at unnecessary words, unnecessary content in books, where it seems like... Um, I think we said it earlier, some writers just want to show us how good they are in terms of their writing and are less interested in telling us a good story. And it often hurts the story. So I like this a lot. Um, you're right, we don't need to see them getting dressed unless there's some specific reason we need to see them getting dressed. Are they wearing something notable that's going to play a part in the story later on? If not, we don't really need two pages of them standing in front of a mirror buttoning a shirt or tying a tie or something like that. Uh, same thing with travel in between two destinations. This is something I've done a lot with my fantasy novels is I wouldn't even... <sighs> Skipping is probably the correct way to put this. Where... Okay, so say two of my characters are walking from one place to another and it takes five days, I don't need to sit there and give you a detailed description of all five days. Does something notable happen in the middle of this journey? Well then maybe that's where we can skip to, right before this notable event takes place. And then after the notable event, they carry on their way and we pick up their story again at the next notable uh, stopping point. Okay, uh, this is their last piece of advice. I'd really like to compliment this person. Can I? There we go. I upvoted this thing from three years ago, so you're welcome. But their last piece of advice is related to the above. Sex scenes and fight scenes can be improved with very similar advice. A blow-by-blow -blow account of either is going to get boring. What's exciting is giving just enough detail that the reader fills in the gaps with their own imagination. Again, yes, um... It's, like they said, very similar to the previous point that they made. But yes, unless, for example, you're reading an erotica book, most people probably aren't really going to be all that interested in reading a blow-by-blow -blow sex scene. If you are, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's, you know, a specific genre where you can go to find that. I personally wouldn't want to find that, say, in a science fiction book. Fight scenes. Um, I've always thought of fight scenes as trying to play out a movie in my head and transfer that into the viewer's head while giving them room to envision things for themselves as well. And I really like this advice. So, again, I really like everything this person had to say. Next piece of advice we're coming to. Expert advice, I should say. I don't know if this counts as advanced advice, but I would say don't forget to include things like smells, temperatures, textures, and other sensations. I feel like a lot of writers are influenced by TV, where the only information is sight and sound, so that's all they use in their writing. Yes, I agree with this 
to an extent. As we were talking about earlier, it's easy to go overboard with our descriptions, but I appreciate the idea behind this advice. Things like temperature and feelings, overall just putting yourself in the character's five senses. So for example, what are they feeling if they're outdoors? Is it hot? Is it cold? How does that impact things like their mood, the people around them? Are they wearing a heavy coat? That, that's important. I didn't really mean to get sidetracked there, but I will a little bit. You can describe these things without saying it was hot or it was cold. You could say something like, Tony stepped out of his front door, taking great care to zip up his coat as he went. Okay, so he's probably not doing this if it's 100 degrees outside, so we can infer temperature from that. We can infer something about his environment and his surroundings. I especially like um, utilizing when you can the senses of smell and taste because I think there's something that we as human beings really connect to. We really, we have a lot of memories based on things like smell and taste and if you can transfer those sensations from your book to your reader, I think you're doing a really good job. One book that I read somewhat recently late last year. It was called A Gentleman in Moscow by Immortals. And it's not the type of book, it's not in a genre that I would typically read, but I had heard really good things about it, so I decided to try it out. And I enjoyed it, and I recommend it for anyone. But one thing that really stood out to me about that book were the scenes in the restaurant of the hotel, in the descriptions of the food and the way the food tasted. And to be honest, it made me hungry all the time constantly reading these descriptions, but I think it's one of the things that really helped me connect to the main character of the book is I was thinking about this wonderful food they were eating and what that would taste like. It's something that we really relate to as human beings. Great way to connect to your reader if you can effectively communicate things like taste and smell. Let's see what else we have. This is kind of a longer one, but we'll dive into it. The average person who reads your book is going to be someone who reads a lot. This means a few important things. First is, you don't really need to dumb down your vocabulary much, if at all. Even in something like YA. The average actual teenager who reads for fun probably has a bigger vocabulary than the average adult anyway. This also means they are savvy to how stories go. Your basic twists and turns won't cut it to surprise people or hold much interest. Foreshadowing is something like a person having a dream or being told some random information that seems like it might be useful later or is intentionally vague does not really shock people. <clears throat> so what you want when planting a red herring for your plot twist is what I call a story plausible red herring. That means that your red herring, the thing the readers think is going to happen instead of what will actually happen, is something that actually would make for a good story and fill out the rest of your work. Hmm, this is an interesting point. I can't really disagree with it. it. It's true that most people who pick up your book, who pick up any book, are going to be people who generally enjoy reading and are likely going to be people who read a lot of books. Um, there's always that chance that you're going to be the author that grabs someone that's never read a book before in their life and you're the one that's going to convert them. and. You know what? Kudos to you if that's the case. But I think there's a lot of sense to targeting an audience that's well read. AKA, as they put it, you don't need to dumb down your vocabulary. You don't need to do really basic twists and turns, unless you're writing maybe a children's book or something like that. But like they said, even YA, for example, I love this sense. The actual teenager who reads for fun probably has a bigger vocabulary than the average adult anyways which is probably true. So, yeah, I think there's certainly some merit to things like marketing and directing your writing towards people who are well-read, people who enjoy it. Yeah, you want to try to make it accessible to anyone who picks it up, but it's a fairly safe assumption that most people who pick up a book are going to be people who read books for fun. I like it. What else have we got here? 
Avoid repetition. This applies to not repeating unusual words too often, but also not letting scenes repeat themselves. If the same thing happens in two scenes, it should be, still be wildly different, e.g. the bad guy gets away, but the first time it's because he was prepared, and the second time it was because a former good guy betrayed the heroes. This is fair, too. And repetition, you know, it sounds like obvious advice, avoiding repetition, but even world-class writers fall into this trap. Um, one writer that I can think of, and I, I'm going to name them, but... I love this writer and I love their work is George Martin and the only reason I bring him up is because a lot of people like to make fun of the fact that in each of his books he tends to have one or two phrases for example that always seem to get repeated for example in his most recent book <clears throat> like 11 years ago George uh, he, one particular character would pretty much walk up to everyone he would meet and ask where do whores go and it gets repetitive, you know, it, it's an easy trap to fall into, and that's just his style, and maybe that's your style, and that's fine, but overall, I agree that repetition is a good thing to avoid, and it's not easy to do. Here's a short one, and I like it. Don't try to be a good writer, try to be an effective writer. Don't try to write a great comedy novel, try to make people laugh. This is a, a great point put into very few words, and I like it. Don't sit out here trying to be the next Stephen King, the next um, Tolkien, the next George Martin. You don't need to do any of that. What you need to try to do is tell a good story. As they say, be an effective writer. Instead of trying to write the great comedy novel, try to make people laugh. Instead of trying to write the next Lord of the Rings, try to go on an enjoyable adventure. If you do this, the title of Good Writer, I did air quotes with my fingers like you could see them there, it'll just sort of come along with the experience. You know who people think are good writers? People whose stories they enjoy. So, 100% agree. Looking for more. What have we got? Let's do a couple more and then we're going to wrap this. It's not going to be quite as long as the last episode. Just a quick comment on vocabulary. This is highly dependent on the character. Whether in first person or third person point of view, I try to hew closely to the words they would use and the concepts of the world they live within. This is especially important in historical fiction and fantasy sci-fi, as you can explain so much about the world through how your characters think about it. Avoiding info dumps and making the world seem vividly immerse. immersive. Excuse me. Yes, um, especially this vocabulary bit. It's funny. I was watching a television series based on fantasy novels a few years ago, and the vocabulary they had adapted for this show was just so ridiculously out of place. And it really took you out of the series. So I feel this 100%. As a fantasy writer, it, it can be a little difficult at times. But it's important. And it's a good way to immerse your reader in the story. And also to not take your reader out of the story. By putting some ridiculous form of dialogue from the modern world into your historical fiction. It's, it's a great point. It's important not to dumb things down, but it's also important to realize that a rich esoteric vocabulary is not available to all your characters, and that native intelligence can be incommensurate with a breadth of vocabulary. In other words, your plain speaking character can be philosophical or wise, and in fact this stealth wisdom thing is done so often by authors that it's become a trope because it can be so effective when executed thoughtfully. That was the same person as the last bit of advice, and I, I agree with it. You have to understand, you know, if assuming you're writing about a diverse cast of characters, perhaps from a diverse set of backgrounds, there's going to be varied vocabulary there. So, to make it realistic anyway, 
Each character should have their own unique vocabulary, and some aren't going to be as expansive as others, and you don't necessarily need to make that character be less intelligent because their vocabulary is not as advanced. I, I like it. Very good. Very good piece of advanced writing advice. Okay. Let's find one or two more. I'm not going to read this whole one because I don't want to spoil anyone on this particular series, but I like this, so we're going to read the first part. A good one that I heard from Russell T. Davies, the ex-head writer of Doctor Who, was about writing heroic moments for characters, and was essentially that whenever you want to give a character a heroic moment, you have them work against their own flaws. I'm going to stop there because they go into plot details about the show, but I love this. The best way for a character to really show heroism is to essentially not only be fighting against an external cause of conflict, but against their own limitations. I think that's fantastic. And one point they made at the end of that post that I like, it works the opposite way with villains or antagonists too. You know, uh, Tywin Lannister in Game of Thrones is ruthlessly pragmatic and logical, but emotional when it comes to his wife and son, Tyrion. So they have their undoing when they work against their flaws. And I think that's very well put. Now we're going to close on this one because I 100% agree with it. Writer's block means you need to do more planning, thinking, and research. It's not because you've been cursed or involuntarily procrastinating. You just don't have enough say in the moment that meet your standards of interest and quality. Working on the planning and background isn't something you should feel guilty about versus actual writing. Because it's all part of the same process like picking up the pen and dipping it in ink is required to start calligraphy. There's a reason the very first episode of this podcast was about outlining. There's a reason that I advocate for outlining your story every chance that I get that you're probably sick of hearing me talk about it. But I 1000% agree with this. Writer's block is usually related to a lack of planning. And I'm going to use a personal example that's occurred to me very recently. I ran into a case of writer's block writing a chapter of this book. Now, the reason I was struggling with this particular chapter is because it was the first time I've ever written a chapter from this particular character's point of view. So I had the events of the chapter perfectly planned out in my outline. But what I hadn't done properly is give myself a chance to get into this character's mind. How does their thought process work? What is their voice like? How do they see the world and how do I transfer that to the reader? Because thus far in this book, the entire story has taken place from one character's point of view. Now we're in a completely different point of view from a different character who has a very complex mindset. And I struggled with it. And I realized afterwards that it's not always enough just to outline in terms of what happens in this chapter X, Y, Z. Sometimes, especially if you're in a situation like this where it's your first time really exploring a character, maybe give yourself some notes about you know, what's that character's mindset, what are their emotions, what do you want to do with the character's voice in terms of speaking to the reader. I think that's great advice. Once again, outline your books. You don't have to. I just recommend it. Episode 1 of this series. Check it out. So I hope maybe you've gleaned a little bit of knowledge from this segment, this episode on writing advice that's meant to be good writing advice. For the most part, I agree with most of the pieces of advice I read on this episode today. I think that most writers could take at least something away from them. I hope you enjoyed the show today. If you did, please make sure you hit that thumbs up button. If you want to subscribe, you can hit that red button in the lower right hand corner. It'll take care of that for you. Would love to have you back for future episodes. Uh, I'm always interested in hearing from listeners, so if you have questions, comments, feedback, you can reach me on my website. It's linked down below, petebeal.com. little form you can fill out to reach me. Same thing if you're interested in coming on the podcast and talking to me. That's all linked down below. Check it out. 
I'm going to try to be back with another episode in a couple of weeks. I've got a big book release coming up, so maybe we'll be able to time something out for that. We'll figure something out. Don't worry. We will be back soon. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the episode, in addition to, obviously, the form you can fill out at the website, you can also drop a comment down below. I check those as well. Okay, I think that's all I have for you today. Please, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay creative, and always keep writing. Thank you very much for listening.